Paul Baggett, and I'm a professor of English and a coordinator of peace and conflict studies, and a member of the Harding Lecture Committee at SDSU. Before introducing this evening's speaker, I'd like to recognize uh, the sponsors for this evening's event. In addition to being uh, our Harding Distinguished Lecturer, Chris Hedges is also being sponsored by our Department of Journalism and Mass Communications as the 2012 Lusk Fellow for his distinguished Pulitzer Prize winning work in the field of journalism. Mr. Hedges is also sponsored by the Department of English and by Philosophy and Religion. Finally, I want to talk, uh, thank my, or acknowledge my Peace and Conflict Studies students uh, in the past years who read and discussed Mr. Hedges' work with such interest and passion and enthusiasm. Hedges' um, ability to engage their interest and challenge them to think critically about some of the most uh, timely topics of our day convinced me that we had to bring this prolific and exciting writer and speaker to campus. Now uh, to uh, introduce our distinguished speaker. To those who, of you who uh, adamantly oppose discussing politics and religion in the presence of family or with polite company, you may not wish to invite this evening's speaker to your next dinner party. <laughs> In fact, it is probably safe to say that Chris Hedges has fearlessly tackled the whole spectrum of what we might consider sensitive topics, including United States addiction to war, the corrupting influences of corporate power, pornography, professional wrestling, Christian fundamentalism, and neo-atheism which Hedges identifies as a new fundamentalist force in America. Indeed, Hedges' topics of analysis are as wide-ranging as they are provocative. Though wide-ranging, Hedges' critical commentaries have a similar goal. They all offer a disruptive, dissenting, morally grounded voice within the American public sphere a public sphere which Hedges convincingly argues has become congested with fantasies, illusions, myths, and outright lies. For him, cable television's coverage of the first Gulf War, as well as the current presidential campaign, should strike all of us as offensive, vapid, and grotesque as a pornographic film or a professional wrestling uh, spectacle. Not only are these mere spectacles, but more critically, they are spectacles that keep us from confronting the moral collapse that surrounds us. As an English professor, I'd like to think that Mr. Hedges' conviction to speak truth to power and corruption is the direct result of his undergraduate training in English literature in Colgate University. <laughs> Or perhaps it comes from his father, a Presbyterian minister, or from his graduate training at the Harvard Divinity School, both of which contributed to the strong moral thrust one finds in his writings. But one cannot talk of Chris Hedges without discussing his 15 years as a war correspondent. I actually, that was 15 years in the New York Times, it's more like 20. And surely these years emboldened his conviction to pursue truth and to warn us of the violence that results from widespread indifference to the abuses of power. His being, and I quote, ambushed in Central America, imprisoned in Sudan, beaten by Saudi military police, deported from Libya and Iran, captured and held for a week by the Republic, uh, Iraqi Republican Guard, strafed by Russian MiG-21s in Bosnia, fired upon by Serb snipers and shelled for days in Sarajevo, all left him with painful memories, which he confesses, quote, lie buried and untouched most of the time. But like Holocaust survivor and human rights advocate, Stefan Hessel, whose 2010 book, Time for Outrage, argues that all of us today need to become outraged like those who participated in the French resistance during World War II, Hedges has learned to channel his own outrage toward worthy causes 
persistently advocating for society's most vulnerable members, including unemployed coal miners, underpaid Hispanic produce pickers, inner city African Americans, and struggling Native Americans living within reservation communities. His outrage is being heard from, by audiences across the nation as Hedges encourages us not only to recognize social injustice when he sees it, but to participate in nonviolent forms of civil, civil disobedience. The title of this evening's lecture is Death of the Liberal Class, which is the same title of his 2010 book. However, much has happened since then, not the least of which are the uprisings in the Middle East, the Occupy Wall Street movement, and the publication of Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt, a book whose first chapter should resonate with all of us as it focuses on the Pine Ridge Reservation. We therefore encourage Mr. Hedges not to limit himself to discussing death of the liberal class, but rather to speak about any topics he finds most pressing and timely. It is thus my privilege to welcome Mr. Hedges to the podium. Please help me give him a warm welcome. work, uh, and that is why I want to begin with Death of the Liberal Class. Uh, my publisher calls the last three books, Empire of Illusion, The End of Literacy and the Triumph of Spectacle, Death of the Liberal Class, and Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt, which I spent the last two years writing with the graphic illustrator Joe Sacco, a trilogy, and I think that's right. Um, Death of the Liberal Class began as a book about the press. Uh, I was approached by a New York publisher, Knopf, and asked if I would do the book. Um, it was a good lesson for me as a writer. If there are any writers out here, don't ever write a book that's someone else's idea. Um, and I turned in the manuscript, and the Knopf editors read it, and they hated it. And they said, okay, well, we'll publish it but we're going to assign an editor to take out all the negativity. Um, and you can imagine how that went down. Um, and so I got Nation Books to buy. You get, with a book advance, you get half of your advance, uh, and then when you turn in the manuscript, the other half. And I got them just to you pay the pay Kanaf off for that first half advance to take the whole book. And in the transition but, you know, between publishers, I began to reflect that it wasn't just the press that has failed us as an institution, but all of the pillars of the liberal establishment, including public education, especially public universities, um, the Democratic Party, labor, uh, culture, as it has become commercialized, uh, and the liberal religious institutions that I come out of, such as the Presbyterian Church. Uh, the press hardly exists in a vacuum. And so I rewrote the book and broadened it to look at the pillars of the liberal establishment and what had happened to them. Uh, beginning from the premise that the liberal society, liberal institutions, were never designed to be the political left. They function as a kind of safety valve to make incremental and piecemeal reform possible, as Karl Popper points out in The Open Society and its Enemies. And that look at, at the, what happened to our liberal establishment led me back to World War I and Woodrow Wilson, who I think is a very dark figure in American history. Now on the eve of World War I, we had numerous radical and populist movements, in particular labor, uh, that was challenging the robber baron class of the late 19th century. Uh, we had 70 socialist mayors in this country, including in cities like Milwaukee. Um, and as the great political writer Dwight MacDonald, an essayist, writes, World War I was the rock on which they broke. And what happened was that Wilson, 
who in campaigning for re-election on the slogan, he kept us out of the war, knew that there was no popular support to speak of within the United States for entrance into World War I. But with the collapse of Tsarist Russia and the Eastern Front, there was the very real possibility that the Kaiser could move up to 100 divisions back to the Western Front and defeat the British and the French. The French were already decimated, and the uh, last British campaign in Passchendaele um, had severely weakened the British forces. So uh, Wall Street understood that that defeat would mean that the massive loans that they had given to the French and the British would never be repaid. And so once again, you had Wall Street institutions pushing the Wilson administration into war, something that was aided by when the Kaiser decided to create a naval blockade around Britain and, and he sunk, I believe, three American merchant ships. So the government is faced with the fact that there's no support for this war and yet they have to propel the country into it. And there's a fascinating, but again, sort of um, very problematic American intellectual, Walter Lippmann, who's very close to Wilson. And Wilson wants to use the harsher forms of control, uh, such as the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act, to uh, shut down any kind of dissent against the war. And Lippmann argues, and he writes a book after the war called Public Opinion, where he talks about the process of manufacturing consent. That's where the phrase comes from. Lippmann argues that by creating a system of modern mass propaganda, you can essentially seduce most of the country behind the war effort. And that the harsher forms of control, such as the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act, will only have to be used for the most recalcitrant forces who refuse to get behind the war effort. And so we create something called a committee uh, for public information, uh, or the Creole Commission. It was headed by a muckraking journalist named George Creel that has massive government resources behind it. It has its own film division in Hollywood. It makes movies like uh, The Kaiser, The Butcher of Berlin. It has its own news bureaus, which churn out daily pro-war news stories and every bit of far more diversified press than we have now. And every publication had to run pro-war news stories, and not only that, had to take pro-war editorial stances. Uh, so you had uh, socialist publications like The Masses, which shuts down because it refuses to do so, or Appeal to Reason, which had the fourth highest circulation in the United States, running these pro-war stories, taking a pro-war stance. The architects of the Committee for Public Information understood by drawing on the studies of crowd psychology, pioneered by Le Bon, Trotter, and Sigmund Freud, that people are not moved by fact or reason, but by the skillful manipulation of emotion. And Edward Bernays, the father of the modern public relations industry, comes out of the Creole Commission. All of the people who work on the Creole Commission, once the war is over, head to Madison Avenue and start working for corporations. And Bernays' book, Propaganda, published in the early 20s, becomes the seminal text that Goebbels uses when he builds the Nazi propaganda machine. And if you read those intellectuals like Randolph Bourne and Jane Addams, who refuse to be sucked into this pro-war hysteria, um, there's a constant sort of a line of despair, not only in how easily the masses have been seduced into supporting the war, but how the intellectual class itself has been seduced into supporting the war. And uh, this, the, the, the few figures who resist, like Debs, Eugene V. Debs, socialist presidential candidate who in 1912 polled 6% uh, of the vote, 900,000 votes, uh, ends up, of course, in prison. Wilson imprisons him for opposing the draft. And what happens after the war, I think, is a, is a kind of major turning point in American history. Again, I go back to Dwight MacDonald, the great intellectual who wrote about it, he said that, that in the transition, as all of the members of the Committee for Public Information went to Madison Avenue and began to work 
for, um, for corporate corporations and businesses and created the modern public relations industry, you saw instilled into the American fabric what he calls the psychosis of permanent war, whereby the dreaded Hun is instantly replaced with a dreaded Red. And you begin the hysteria of anti-communism, of searching out for people who are communists or soft on communists and lower, closet communists. Um, and, and McDonald points out, I think correctly, that none of the political theorists, including Karl Marx of the 19th century, grappled with the phenomena of permanent war, the psychosis of permanent war, where you can essentially get in McDonald's words, the masses to call for their own enslavement. And at the same time, we see the rise of what I would call corporate culture. Um, many of you, or some of you, may come out, as I did, of farming communities. I mean, I think of my grandparents, and there were still uh, values uh, that, that I think are antithetical to the consumer society that were very much a part of their own uh, uh, sense of who they were, and that was thrift, self-effacement, um, hard work, uh, and these were these values were consciously replaced uh, by corporations that start to instill consumption as a kind of inner compulsion that created the cult of the self. And there's a really great memoir by Malcolm Cowley, who used to be Faulkner's editor, but. Uh, had been an ambulance driver in World War I and then come back and lived in Greenwich Village and wrote, wrote quite critically, actually, about the Bohemians and later the Beats. It's called uh, um, An Exile Returns. It's kind of intellectual history of the 20s and 30s. And he talks about precisely that, that, that within the sort of Bohemian culture, while they saw themselves in opposition to these forces, in fact, they embodied, they, they were infected with the same kind of hedonism, the same kind of cult of the self. Uh, and this became, uh, you know, in essence, severed uh, what had been an intellectual radical class from the working class. One of the chapters in uh, this book, Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt, is out of the coal fields of southern West Virginia. And if you went into southern West Virginia before World War I, Mother Jones, and uh, you know John Lewis, and these were the figures that were heroes to miners. Um, so after the war, that's when you actually saw the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act used extensively. Uh, they shut down the masses. They shut down appeal to reason. Uh, you saw anarchists like Emma Goldman and Berkman deported, uh, and there was at the same time. Yeah, the Wobblies, the old anarcho-syndicalist union, Big Bill Haywood has to flee the country, spends the last 10 years of his life in deep misery living in Moscow, uh, and uh, Joe Hill, the organizer, uh, labor organizer, is uh, trumped up murder, murder charges, it's hung in Utah. So these radical movements are, are decimated. And at the same time, internally, liberal institutions are hollowed out in the name of anti-communism. Um, now, the last time that the liberal establishment worked the way that I think it's supposed to within a capitalist democracy comes with the breakdown of capitalism in the 1930s with the New Deal. And there you have Roosevelt and his vice president, Henry Wallace, responding to the suffering of tens of millions of Americans uh, who, because of the Great Depression, have been thrust into destitution. And when Conrad Black writes his biography of Roosevelt, he says that Roosevelt's greatest achievement is that he saved capitalism. And I think Black is right. That the liberal class, and Karl Popper, the great Viennese political philosopher, spends a lot of time talking about this, makes that incremental or piecemeal reform possible. So that when there is tremendous pressure from the base and suffering, there are ways to work within the system to ameliorate that suffering. And what happens after World War I is we decimate what's left of this essentially liberal and radical establishment through the McCarthy hearings. You go back and look at the 1950s, and Ellen Stricker has written a couple good books on this, you find thousands of high school teachers, university professors, 
artists, musicians, directors, writers. It's how a figure like I.F. Stone, probably you know, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, investigative journalist in the 20th century becomes a pariah. He can't even get a job at the Nation magazine. Um, you have uh, institutions essentially purged. Universities lost thousands of professors. I taught a couple of years ago uh, as a visiting professor for a semester at the University of Toronto and met one of the 20th century's great mathematicians, Chandler Davis, who was caught up in that purge. She refused to name names uh, when he was hauled before the House Un-American Activities Committee and uh, in prison for six months. And when he got out, he couldn't get a job. He spent his career teaching uh, mathematics at the University of Toronto. Uh, and this was, I think, uh, a kind of body blow to American democracy. Uh, all of the openings in American democracy, and when you go back and look at the formation of American democracy and how it's in spends a lot of time, I think, laying this out. Um, you see that the, the founders were terrified of, of, of direct democracy, terrified of popular democracy, and created mechanisms by which uh, the popular will would always be thwarted. That's what the Electoral College is about. We saw it in uh, 2000, when Al Gore actually won uh, 500,000 more votes uh, than did George W. Bush. Uh, and if they had a fair recount in Florida, probably even more than that. Um, and, and yet he's not president because he didn't win the electoral uh, college. Uh, you saw the, uh, used to be the senators were appointed rather than elected. Uh, you saw, uh, you know, huge swaths of the population disenfranchised, not only Native Americans, African Americans, and women, but also uh, men without property. And so that, the opening or the expansion of American democracy has largely been made possible by movements that fought against the restrictive nature of the democratic system. So you have the Liberty Party that fought slavery, you have the suffragists who fought for women's rights, you have the labor movement, and you have the civil rights movement. And none of these movements ever achieved formal positions of power. And yet you could argue, at least until April of 1968 when he was assassinated, uh, that in those years, the most powerful political figure in the United States was Martin Luther King. Because when he went to Memphis, or Selma, 50,000 people went with him. And that's how a democracy is meant to function. It puts pressure on liberal institutions that have the capability of, of opening up the system enough to address the grievances from the base. When you destroy those liberal institutions, then you create a system of political paralysis, which I would argue we live under. And if you look at the polls, uh, I think Congress's approval rating is now below 10%. Somebody can correct me, but it's pretty bad. Well, it's not wrong. I think the American public have totally figured out uh, what the game is, uh, and that these people are not responding, that, they, that, that, that there's a kind of that the system itself is paralyzed. Uh, this was a, a deep concern of Dostoevsky, who had watched the same paralysis at the end of the 19th century, and his novel Demons is about this, and Notes from Underground is about this. And Dostoevsky writes that when these, these systems to, to adjust and create, uh, open up you know, reforms to create the possibility by which people suffering can be uh, redressed, shut down, you enter what he calls an age of moral nihilism. So all of the mechanisms, and, and there were a lot of workers in this country who paid for it with their lives, especially in the late 19th century in places like Ludlow and uh, Homestead where workers were gunned down by militias, Scranton, Pennsylvania, and other places. Uh, all of these mechanisms with the, with the destruction of radical movements and the disemboweling of liberal institutions, making them extremely weak, then there was no impediment to the rise of corporate capitalism. And uh, I think that we have to sort of note that there are different types of capitalism. There is the penny capitalism in the farm town where I grew up. That's where farmers brought their produce in and sold it. There's regional capitalism of the small business owner or the hardware store owner who sits on the school board, pays taxes, uh, 
you know, lives and cares about the community. And then there's something else called corporate capitalism, which is supranational. It has no loyalty to the nation state. Uh, and, and, and it rips down trade barriers, which of course is what we're undergoing, uh, to create a kind of global oligarchy, a kind of global neo-feudalism. And what we saw beginning in the 1970s was a shift in the American economy, where we went from being what the Harvard historian Charles Mayer calls an empire of production, where we actually produce things, to what he calls an empire of consumption, where we began to borrow to maintain both a level of consumption and an empire we can no longer afford. And that's why real wages have declined or remained stagnant for most of the American working class since the 1970s. We saw the rise at this time of what I would call a faux liberalism. And Bill Clinton, for me, sort of epitomizes it, although Obama's not far behind. And this is a liberalism where they continue to speak in that traditional feel your pain language of liberals and yet assiduously serve corporate interests. And there was, of course, uh, an understanding that by serving corporate interests, the Democratic Party would get corporate money. And by the 1990s, the Democratic Party had fundraising parity with the Republicans, and when Barack Obama ran for the first time in 2008, he actually got more. But the cost of that was a betrayal of the constituency that the liberal establishment once protected. So you have Clinton pushing through NAFTA, which was probably the greatest assault on the working class in this country since the 1948 Taft-Hartley Act, which makes it very difficult to organize. You have Clinton deregulating the FCC, and that's not a small factor, because what it does is consolidate information into the hands of roughly a half dozen corporations, Viacom, General Electric, Rupert Murdoch's News Corp, uh, Disney, Clear Channel. You have Clinton ripping down the firewalls between commercial and investment banks, which precipitates the economic crisis itself. And you have Clinton destroying welfare. Uh, and you have to remember that under the old welfare system, 70% of the recipients were children. All of this comes under a Democratic president. Um, and corporate money, uh, begins to drive politics. Uh, something that uh, began under Reagan was actually accelerated under Clinton when the Democratic Party became hostage to corporate interests. Uh, and that's why there is a stunning continuity between the policies of the Bush administration and the Obama administration. Whatever their intentions, and I've never met Barack Obama, I've never met George Bush, I don't know, uh, there is no way, finally, to vote against the interests of Goldman Sachs. You see it in the largest transference of wealth upwards in American history, which across the political spectrum has no support. I mean, the, that first bailout package of $700 billion, constituent calls into congressional offices were 101 against the bailout, and that did not matter whether you were a right-wing Republican from Texas or you were Barney Frank from Massachusetts. There was a consensus within the American public and yet it passes anyway. If you look at the assault on civil liberties, which is very much a part of sort of the corporate state, John Ralston Saul, the Canadian philosopher uh, who's written two really smart books, one is Voltaire's Bastards and the other is Unconscious Civilization, argues that what's happened is we have undergone what he calls a coup d'etat in slow motion. And I think that's right. Uh, if you look at, um, policy after policy after policy, which of course are written by some of the 35,000 corporate lobbyists. If, if there finally is no way for us as citizens anymore to significantly uh, affect systems of governance. And I think that the low voter turnout, the low approval ratings of Congress, and by the way, the very low approval ratings for the press, which I also think is not misplaced, are evidence that within the body politic, again, and across the political spectrum, there is a deep feeling or deep kind of understanding uh, that the system isn't working as it should work. Uh, you, if you want to take a good example, I, I think Obamacare is, is a kind of a case study of the point I'm trying to make. Obamacare was first formulated by the Heritage Foundation, a right-wing think tank. They wrote it. 
It was their idea. Then it was first put into practice in 2006 by then Governor Mitt Romney in Massachusetts, and then it was adopted by Barack Obama. 2,000 pages of it written by pharmaceutical and insurance uh, lobbyists who put into that bill $447 billion in subsidies, the equivalent of the bank bailout bill for the pharmaceutical insurance industry. And what happens, we have the, you know, I've lived in Europe, I have a dual national, I have, have a Swiss passport, I've lived in Switzerland. Switzerland, by the way, does not have a private, uh, does not have a public healthcare system. It's, it's private, it's just regulated. So every Swiss citizen pays about 350 francs into the system, and they have, the Swiss have arguably the best healthcare uh, system in the world, certainly one of them. My son was born in Lausanne. Um, uh, and we have the least efficient, the most costly and the least efficient. About 40 cents on every dollar goes towards corporate profits. Uh, and if you look at uh, Obamacare, uh, you see built within it the kind of flaws. And I have a great deal of sympathy for, um, you know, the, the sort of Tea Party Republican stance against Obamacare. It, it is forcing us to buy a defective product. I mean, one of the first things that the Obama administration did after passing Obamacare was give exemptions to insurance companies who did not want to insure chronically ill children which they got. But think about that in moral terms. It means we live in a country where it is legally permissible for corporations to hold sick children hostage while their parents bankrupt themselves trying to save their sons and daughters. That's the world we've created. Um, <coughs> Sheldon Wolin, who is probably our greatest living political philosopher, and if there are any poli-sci students, they've probably read his 1960 book, Politics and Vision, wrote a few years ago a book called Democracy Incorporated. And in it, he describes our political system as one that he calls inverted totalitarianism. And by that, he means it's not classical totalitarianism. It doesn't find its expression uh, through a demagogue or a charismatic leader, but through the anonymity of the corporate state. That in classical totalitarian regimes, you have a reactionary or revolutionary force that overthrow and replace a decaying structure. In inverted totalitarianism, you have corporate forces that purport to pay fealty to electoral politics, the iconography and language of American patriotism, and the Constitution, and yet, internally, have seized all of the levers of power to render the citizen impotent. And I think that's right. I think Wolin's right. Uh, I think the system has been taken from us, and I think Citizens United, the 2010 ruling, was sort of the end. Uh, that at that point, it became utterly impossible for us in any meaningful way to affect the system. Now, the danger is that when you have a system that serves the interests of Wall Street, rather the interests of, of in the language of Occupy, the 99%, um, they know no limits. Carl Polanyi, 1944, writes, uh, an economist, writes a great book, uh, The Great Transformation, which is a look at unfettered capitalism. What happens when all restraints are lifted on capital? How does it function? And how it functions, Polanyi argues, is that it has the capacity to commodify everything. So that human beings become commodities and the natural world becomes a commodity that it then exploits until exhaustion or collapse. And Polanyi argues that with those restraints, regulations, and controls lifted, built within that system is a quality of self-annihilation because it knows no limits. And if you look at the, the response on the part of uh, the fossil fuel industry towards uh, the melting of 40% of the summer Arctic sea ice, you can see exactly what Pogliani is talking about. It is the fossil fuel industry that has determined our relationship to the planet. 40% of the summer, summer Arctic sea ice is gone, and they start fighting over who's going to mine the last vestiges of mineral, minerals, oils, gas, and fish stocks. It, it's, you know, it makes Herman Melville's novel Moby Dick, the most prescient study of the American character, where we're all aboard the Pequod, and we're all, uh, you know, the ship is being steered by Ahabs, and Ahab says, my, my methods and my means are sane, only my object is mad. 
not to respond to the climate crisis, um, not to respond rationally to uh, what's happened within economic systems, and I'm sure many of you are following the debacle in Europe, in Greece and Spain and Portugal, um, which we are not going to be immune from, uh, to allow your system to essentially be run by people who only know how to service that system at the expense of everyone else uh, is, um, you know, an absolutely terrifying phenomenon. And yet we as citizens have lost the power uh, to, in essence, affect these forces that are determining our relationship to the ecosystem on which, in the end, the human species depends for life, as well as a global economy that falsely believes money is real, um, that somehow gambling is an effective way to produce more money. Um, and, and what you have created now is a kind of global neo-feudalism. Workers in the United States and elsewhere, elsewhere are constantly told that they have to be competitive in a global marketplace, which means being competitive with prison labor in China or sweatshop workers in Bangladesh who make 22 cents an hour. And unfortunately, the liberal establishment has largely been uh, neutered or bought off. And I've taught at Princeton. Uh, Princeton functions as a, as a corporation. Uh, it, it, uh, it is these elite institutions that churn out the systems managers for Wall Street. I think it was two years ago, 49% of the graduating class at Harvard all went into the financial services sector. And that doesn't count all the people who went to law school and became corporate lawyers. You hear President Obama talk about education as a problem. It's in fact the best educated among us who created the mess. Um, the problem was not education. The problem was greed. And uh, we've unfortunately created an elite that no longer seeks to protect the common good, nor does it seek to create both the economic and democratic systems that gave working and middle class Americans a chance. Uh, indeed, it's harvesting the country. Uh, you see, not only are these corporate CEOs willing to defraud consumers, they defraud shareholders. Uh, they're grabbing as much as fast as they can on the way out the door. And it was with that kind of understanding that came out of death of the liberal class that I set out to write Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt. Where I wanted, and I did, go to absolutely the poorest pockets of the United States, consciously, to look at what happens in sacrifice zones, places that have been sacrificed before the altar of the marketplace. The whole idea that you should structure your society around the dictates of the marketplace is a utopian fantasy. There's nothing in three or 5,000 years, if we go back that far in economic history, to justify this absurdity. Uh, and yet that has become the prevailing ideology, you know, whether you're a neoliberal or a neoconservative or anyone else, that you should kneel before the dictates of the marketplace. And so I went first to Pine Ridge, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with Pine Ridge. I, I had not, it was the first time I was out there without them for several weeks. Uh, and, and one of the reasons I brought Joe Sacco in on the book, who is a remarkable journalist in his own right. He, uh, I met him in Bosnia in 1995 when he was doing his book, A Safe Area Garage. And what Joe does is he goes in and reports stories out, but then he draws it out, you know, he does the interviews, he does all the work of a reporter, but then he draws it out. It's very labor intensive, it takes him years to do it. He did a really, a, a masterpiece on the Palestine-Israel Israel conflict called uh, Footnotes in Gaza. That took him six years to finish. But I wanted Sako on the book because all of these people have been rendered invisible and by the wider culture. We don't see them. Uh, the suffering on Pine Ridge, which again, many of you are familiar with, but I would say the wider American public has absolutely no knowledge of it all, is pretty staggering. I mean, the average life expectancy for a male at Pine Ridge is 48. That is the lowest in the Western Hemisphere outside of Haiti. Uh, at, at any one time, 60% um, of the people on Pine Ridge, many of them are living in sod huts, have neither electricity or running water. But the reason Pine Ridge is 
you know, and why we wanted to open the book there, is that that's where the whole sort of project of ceaseless, limitless exploitation and expansion began in the westward push, where you had the railroad magnates, the timber merchants, the mining concerns, uh, the people who slaughtered the buffalo herds and then would ship back just the tongues to the restaurants in New York. Um, they, and, and of course the, the, gen, the genocide that was carried out against Native Americans as you seize that land. Uh, that's where it began. That's where the template for sort of expansion and imperialism began. America was different from Europe in the sense that the Europeans tended to go to India or Africa to create colonies. We actually created the model of colonization internally within our own country. That then became the model that we used in Cuba and the Philippines and uh, are using today in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, and at the same time, we were destroying a competing ethic, another way of relating to the world. Within an animist or an indigenous culture, there is a sense of the sacred. When Pugliani writes his book, The Great Transformation, he actually, well, he's an economist, he actually uses the word sacred. He said that when a society loses the capacity for the sacred, when nothing has, when everything has a monetary value and nothing has an intrinsic value, then that commodification of what is sacred essentially snuffs out, finally, the society itself. And within indigenous culture, you had, first of all, it was communal. I'm not a Marxist, although I think Marx's critique of capitalism is, 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 is you know, fundamental and, and certainly worth reading. The solution is, of course, um, utopian. But uh, when Marx begins his study, he actually, if I got Marx's notebooks out of the rare book room in uh, Princeton, the university, and uh, there are long, long pages where Marx was making detailed studies of the Iroquois and how they govern themselves, which, you know, the Founding Fathers also looked at the Iroquois Federation in terms of, and, and that communal structure that where in an indigenous culture, anyone who hoards things for themselves is despised. It's just a different way of relating to the world and a different way of relating to each other. And I think that um, as much as that westward expansion sought to seize the resources and slaughter those who stood in the way. I think it also feared this competing ethic, this other way of relating to the world. Uh, and that's why we start with Pine Ridge. We moved to Camden, New Jersey, which per capita is the poorest city in the United States. Uh, and if you've been following Camden, just fired, it's also by now, it's always one or two in terms of the most dangerous per capita. And I think this year it's set to, again to become the most dangerous. Um, and they just fired its entire police force because the police force was unionized. And they wanted to break the union and hire uh, police officers who are paid 50% of what unionized officers are paid without benefits and without union support. And they've done it. Uh, that, that what you get in this kind of reconfiguration and uh, you know, the, this Weimarization of the American working class. The destruction of the manufacturing sector has pretty much decimated the working class, and much of my family comes out of the working class, so it's something I've watched as a very personal phenomenon. Uh, and even when you see, uh, for instance, the auto bailout, the, the Democratic Party will speak quite often about saving the auto industry, but what they don't tell you is that they destroy the unions that once made it possible to be an auto worker or a steel worker and earn a salary by which you can maintain a family. So that U UAW workers in the auto industry who were, were making $76 an hour in that bailout negotiations were reduced to 50. But most egregiously, it allowed the companies to hire new workers at $14 an hour. And written into those loans, government loans, was a caveat that said uh, the loans would have to be repaid if there was a strike. Essentially, they broke the unions. The older workers, um, I guess through pressure, sort of sold out the younger workers. Um, we're seeing it with the assault against public sector unions, whether it's the Chicago teacher strike. That's the last readout of protected activity. And uh, when you when we interviewed, I mean, numerous people who uh, you know, in order to make forty or fifty thousand dollars a year, are now working, you know, seventy, seventy-five dollars, uh, seventy, seventy, seventy-five hours a week. 
uh, in places like Walmart, the average worker at Walmart um, makes, works 28 hours a week, and their wages are they're below the poverty line, which is why uh, when you work at Walmart, you're given applications for food stamps. Uh, we subsidize the Walton family fortune. The owners of Walmart, by the way, make $11,000 an hour. And the danger is that the longer this political paralysis continues, uh, uh, these, the more and the, and the less there are any kinds of impediments against these corporate forces, what's happened in these sacrifice zones will now be replicated outside of those zones. We were in southern West Virginia, the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, there you have coal companies that no longer want to dig down for the coal seams. Essentially, extracting coal in this country is heavy machine. They have some of the largest machines on land, 25-story uh, drag lines, uh, and so they blow the top 400 feet off the mountains. I mean, it would be like destroying the Black Hills. Uh, and uh, they've created billion-gallon impoundment ponds filled with heavy metals and toxic sludge, uh, and, and poison the place. Um, we went into Hollins, these back sort of old coal camps, where everybody in the town has had their gallbladder removed because the water's no good. Cancer's an epidemic. Uh, you go into elementary schools, and you go to the nurse's office, and they're just rows of little inhalers for the kids. Uh, and we flew over the Appalachian Mountains, and it'll rip your heart out. Uh, Appalachian Mountains are the lungs of the eastern seaboard. A uh, bunch of the headwaters of the eastern seaboard come out of the Appalachians. And it's just a, a wasteland, hundreds of thousands of acres, which, you know, they, what they'll do is after they blast the top 400 feet off, they'll sort of spray grass on it, which, you know, the rains wash it away. It's terrifying. It's all done in the name of profit. And, you know, here you have one of the most minerally rich regions in the United States and filled with the poorest people in the United States. The people extracting that coal, those companies, none of, they're not even based in the state of West Virginia. And when they finish with West Virginia, they'll just keep going. And, and, and we, we went from West Virginia to Immokalee, Florida, uh, where you have undocumented uh, workers in the produce fields. Because in essence, they're the, they're the perfect worker in the eyes of the corporate state. They have no legal rights, they have no benefits, they gather every morning at four o'clock, uh, and if they get picked for work, they get work, and if they don't get picked, they go home. Uh, they're, you have trailer parks where uh, they put 20 people in a trailer, you have to pay $50 of cash a week. Now that's 2,000 a week for these trailers should have been condemned years ago. Holes in the floor, rats, all that kind of stuff. Mattresses, old mattresses on the floor. And when they can't, when the workers can't get to work, they have to sleep out in the woods. We were out in encampments, uh, people sleeping under mango trees. Uh, and not surprisingly, without any kind of protection, it's the epicenter for slavery, literally. Workers held against their will in barbed wire enclosures, uh, and their, their families are threatened. They're told that if they go to authorities, their families in Honduras or Mexico or wherever will be killed. And we interviewed a worker who for two years had night, had been chained in the back of a truck with other workers, and you know, the workers had been forced to defecate over in a corner. Um, one night, three workers punched their hole through the roof and escaped, went to authorities. Um, but when the Collier County uh, Sheriff's Office tried to get uh, workers to testify under their conditions, they only got three or four because they were terrified of repercussions. And we found one of those workers. Uh, and what happened was after he testified, he was blacklisted. He couldn't get work. And he's an alcoholic, and he sleeps under a mango tree in a park, and he has no work. And what we're seeing as all of uh, the protections against workers are lifted is that those conditions of slavery are now being replicated in other industries. The hotel industry, the garment industry. Uh, and so we end the book um, in Zuccotti Park with the Occupy Wall Street movement. Now, we na named the book two years before Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt, but revolt was conjecture. Uh, and in the last few months of the book, you saw the rise of the Occupy movement, which, and I was deeply involved in it, and, and in some ways often very critical of it, um, and yet it did a couple of things that I thought were important. Uh, it recognized that we have to rebuild those movements and put pressure back on the system.
and it understood that in the end power rests with Wall Street, not with Washington. Uh, and it changed the dialogue where we began to talk about economic inequality uh, instead of a, a deficit crisis. Um, what will happen, I don't know. I mean, the, the response of the state was to physically eradicate these occupying cabinets, and I found that a very frightening moment because if the state had responded rationally, if you read Paul Krugman's columns in the New York Times, he's constantly asking for a rational response, a jobs program. I mean, our unemployment rate, when you count people who have stopped looking for work or people who have poorly paid part-time jobs and want full-time employment, as the Los Angeles Times has pointed out, is probably between 17 and 20 percent. And um, a rational response would mean ameliorating that suffering so that there would be a moratorium on foreclosures and bank repossessions. Student debt would be forgiven. Um, and we'd get a rational health care policy. That would be a rational response. That would be a kind of New Deal response. And, and yet, the response of the corporate state is to end unemployment benefits for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of American citizens. Which means at a time when there's no employment, tens of thousands of these people are going to lose their jobs. We are about to walk over, no matter who gets elected, what, e what both parties are calling the fiscal cliff. The automatic draconian budget cuts that will be put into place because there was no consensus within the Congress as to how to deal with the budget. And yet we have some of the largest corporations in the world, General Electric, Bank of America, they pay no income tax, none. They pay no income tax. Uh, and so when we saw the rise of the Occupy movement, this for us was the beginnings, the rumblings of revolt. I co covered revolutions, insurgencies, popular uprisings, movements all around the world. I covered the revolutions in uh, Eastern Europe. I covered the first and the second Palestinian uprising. I covered the street demonstrations that brought down Milosevic. And as a reporter, having spent the last two years in these sacrifice zones, you know that the tinder is there. You never know what's going to set it off. Often what sets it off is something benign. But I do know that it's always the ruling elite that determines the configuration of revolt or rebellion. And because the ruling elites, which are hostage to corporate power, have not been able to respond to the suffering that has been visited on a larger and larger portion of the American public, and, and let's not forget that the assault on the working class is now being visited upon the middle class. The New York Times ran a story a few weeks ago where it looked at middle class professionals who had lost their jobs in 2008 with a meltdown. And it found that in almost all cases, those who had gotten new jobs were working at salaries that were 40 to 50% less than what they had gotten without benefits. And you cannot maintain a functioning democracy in an oligarchy. That's not a new understanding. Thucydides and Plutarch wrote about it with the decline of Athenian democracy that expanding empire, that empires, because they don't know limits, uh, hollow the countries out from the inside. We can see it around us. The infrastructure is crumbling. Public schools, 61 public schools were just closed in Philadelphia. Libraries are closed. Uh, fire departments are closed. Uh, it, it's all around us. And, um, and what happens is that when a dysfunctional ruling elite cannot respond, it, it employs the harsher forms of control on the outer reaches of empire and brings them back to the home, to the heart of empire. Uh, and, and as Thucydides wrote, the tyranny that Athens imposed on others it finally imposed on itself. And that's why you get this egregious assault against civil liberties. And the Obama administration has been worse in terms of its attack on civil liberties than the Bush administration. First of all, it's refused to restore habeas corpus. It has interpreted the 2001 Authorization to Use Military Force Act as giving it the right to assassinate American citizens. It passed the FISA Amendment Act. Obama had been elected, came back as a senator, and voted for it. The FISA Amendment Act, which again has no support across the political spectrum, 
retroactively made legal what under our Constitution has traditionally been illegal, the warrantless wiretapping, monitoring, and eavesdropping of tens of millions of American citizens, and we now know that all of our information is being stored out in supercomputers in Utah. And it was retroactive because the telecommunication companies gave our personal information to the government without our permission, in clear violation of our constitutional rights. They were being sued in the lower courts, and they knew they'd lose. So they made sure that the, when the lobbyists wrote the bill, it was retroactive to essentially give them immunity. The Obama administration six times has used the Espionage Act. Now, the Espionage Act to, shut, to silence whistleblowers, including the CIA official Sterling, who purported to expose war crimes that were being committed in places like Guantanamo to the New York Times. And the Espionage Act is our Foreign Secrets Act. Up until the Obama administration, it was only used three times against whistleblowers, the first time against Daniel Ellsberg. And what it's done as a former investigative reporter for the New York Times, when I talk to my colleagues, is shut down any kind of, anyone within government who will talk. Any, any government official now is too terrified to defy the official narrative because they can be threatened with prison time. Uh, the Obama administration uh, also signed into law on um, December 31st, uh, the National Defense Authorization Act. Section 1021 of the National Defense Authorization Act permits the U.S. military to arrest American citizens if they are deemed to be, well, in the language of the section, substantially support, that's not defined, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, or what they call associated forces. And uh, hold them in military facilities, including our offshore penal colonies, until, in the language of that section, the end of hostilities. Now, it is a clear and egregious assault against the right of due process for American citizens. And yet, the president signed it into law anyway. I sued the president in January. Um, and uh, went to federal court and in New York, in the Southern District Court in New York. And in September, uh, the court declared the law unconstitutional. Uh, they issued a permanent injunction. Now, the response of the Obama administration was fascinating. Uh, we knew that they would appeal the ruling uh, to the appellate court, and if the appellate court upholds the ruling, it will go to the Supreme Court. But rather than simply appeal it, they first went to the judge and demanded in the name of national security a, an emergency stay until the appellate court heard the ruling, which means the law goes back into effect until the appeal is, can be heard. Judge Forrest refused. So the, we, we had been dealing with government attorneys, you know, district attorneys. Suddenly, the district attorneys disappeared and the lawyers for the Pentagon appeared. And they demanded that, um, and this was now late Friday night, they demanded that 9 a.m. the next Monday, there be an emergency hearing for a stay and an emergency appeal. And the lawyers and I were you know, sort of perplexed until we, the only conclusion that we could come to was that they're already using it. Because uh, if they weren't using it, they could just appeal. If the law is stricken from the books, and they are holding American citizens in military facilities without access to due process, they would be in contempt of court. And our assumption is that probably in places like Bagram, you have Pakistani US dual nationals who are being held and denied due process. The appellate court gave the government the stay, and on the 28th of this month, we began the hearing. All of this came under the Obama administration, and I think it's, for me, emblematic uh, as we watch an election campaign that is going to cost a staggering $2.5 billion, uh, that whatever the intentions of the president or any other candidate, Mitt Romney, the personal narratives of these politicians is largely irrelevant. Uh, that at, at this point, uh, these corporate forces determine uh, 
the configurations of power and the configurations of government. Um, I'll just close by speaking a little bit about some of the movements that I covered uh, because they were really important for my understanding of resistance. I was in uh, East Germany. Now, East Germany, at least until our own country, was probably the, the most efficient security and surveillance state in the world, the Stasi state. And you had all of these movements began a long time ago. In Czechoslovakia, I covered the Velvet Revolution. I was every evening in the Magic Lantern with Václav Havel. All, you know, Havel began Charter 77 in 1977. The revolution didn't happen until 89. And as somebody who has spent so much of my life in war, I hate and detest violence. Uh, I'm not a pacifist, finally. I was in Sarajevo. We were surrounded by the Serbs. We had built a trench system around the city. We certainly knew what would happen if the Serbs broke through. We'd seen the Drina Valley. A third of the city would have been slaughtered. The rest would have been driven into refugee and displacement camps. Uh, we were being hit. Some of you may have been in the military with pretty heavy ordnance, 155 howitzers, 90 millimeter tank shells, Katusha rockets, um, which are fired in bursts of 12 or 24 and can take down a four-story apartment building in a few seconds, killing or severely wounding everyone inside. 2,000 shells a day. Constant sniper fire, four to five dead a day, two dozen wounded a day. By the time I got there in 1995, 45 foreign reporters had already been killed. My photographer was wounded three days after I got there. To sit around one of those basements under that kind of shelling and uh, try to have a discussion about pacifism would have evoked gales of laughter. There are times when, as a human society, you face your own annihilation and uh, you know, you, you, it, it's a perfectly rational response to pick up a weapon uh, to defend your family, your community, and, and your city, and your nation. I get it. And yet it doesn't save you from the poison of violence. Um, you know, and that was something that, and there may be people in the room who lived through it, all my, my father was a sergeant in North Africa, all my uncles were vets, one of them was in the South Pacific, and he came home destroyed, drank himself to death in a trailer. Uh, it doesn't save you from the poison of war. Um, and I certainly want to avoid going there every way possible, uh, which is why I did invest time within uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement and why I've been such a fierce critic. I just debated the black bloc anarchists in New York, uh, and they're a pretty reprehensible group. Um, you know, my assaults on them have actually had a series, I've had a series of death threats from, from the anarchists. Uh, and I watched how when you have a decay ruling elite, an immoral, discredited ruling elite, it is possible to bring the kinds of numbers into the street that put pressure on that elite and, and destroy it. And East Germany did it. Week after week in Leipzig, you would have small groups of Lutheran clergy and congregations holding candlelit vigils uh, in opposition to the East German regime. And, uh, and, and that's kind of the mysterious factor of these elements. They articulate the kind of truth, as Havel was doing in Czechoslovakia. And there's a beautiful essay about it he wrote in 1978 called The Power of the Powerless. That, that the very power you have is you are expressing a truth that unmasks the charade, the political theater. And, and because internally within those systems they understand how rotten it is, they find that truth very threatening. So suddenly in Leipzig, you go from a few hundred people to the fall of 1989 to 70,000 people. And Eric Conacher, the dictator, sends down an elite paratroop division to fire on the crowd. And they refuse. And Hanukkah lasts another week in power. The same thing happened in Czechoslovakia. It was, Czechoslovakia was very moving. Havel was an amazing figure. Um, and you saw how all of that long years of resistance, which the regime had written off as futile, in fact, it kept, as Auden said, you know, this ironic point of life, a life alive. When I was in Prague that winter, up and down the streets were posters of a young Czech university student named Jan Panic. And in 1968, when the Soviets, Dubček had tried to reform the system, and the Soviets had sent in tanks uh, to overthrow him and reinstall 
of essentially a Moscow puppet regime. Panitch had gone to Venceslav Square, the major square in the center of Prague, and in protest lit himself on fire. Four days later, he died of his wounds. Uh, his fellow students, several thousand of them, tried to carry his body to the cemetery uh, and it was broken up by police. Uh, his grave became a shrine and the authorities, and remember, none of this was ever covered in the official press. He was a non-person, the event was never covered. And um, the authorities dug up his body, exhumed it, cremated it, gave the ashes to his mother, and uh, told her that she was not allowed to rebury the ashes. And not only was his picture up and down the streets of Prague, but two weeks after the communist government fell, 10,000 people gathered in Red Army Square, and they renamed it Jan Panic Square. I was in Venceslav Square when the great singer, Czech singer, Marta Kubashaya walked out of the balcony. Half a million people, snowing December. Kubashaya in 68, uh, as the invasion was taking place, had gone on the airways and sung an anthem of defiance. When the Soviet-backed regime took control, she became a non-person. They destroyed her entire recording stock. She was never heard on the airwaves, and she had spent the intervening years working in a toy factory on an assembly line. And when she walked out on that balcony and began singing that anthem, every Czech in that crowd knew every word, and most of them were crying. When you speak a fundamental truth, as Havel writes, when you have the capacity, even if the numbers are small, to keep that truth alive. Finally, when you can draw those forces into the street, you don't use violence. You don't assault the pillars of the regime. In fact, and this is why I have uh, constantly exhorted the uh, occupiers not to insult the police officers in New York because they are working class. They have families who, you know, they've had a default on their mortgages. They have brothers and, and sisters who are unemployed. What happens is that by expressing that truth in a way that is nonviolent and respectful, you can draw segments of that, the pillars of the establishment towards you. People forget that most revolutions, including the Russian Revolution, were nonviolent. The violence in the Russian Revolution, yes, there was a lot of anarchist terrorism, but the revolution itself was not violent. And the violence came from Lenin and the Bolsheviks that carry out an armed push overthrowing uh, the Constituent Assembly. Uh, what broke the Tsar was when there were riots, bread riots in Petrograd, and they raided the warehouses, and they sent the Cossacks in to crush the demonstration, and the Cossacks, instead of firing on the crowd, uh, fraternized with the protesters. The Tsar lasted another week in power, like Honecker, and had to resign in a railway carriage on his way back from, from the front. And I think that in that sense, you know, we have the capacity to build those kinds of numbers uh, and to demand that this corporate coup d'etat be reversed and that uh, power once again, as I think it was within this country, placed back uh, into the hands of citizens. And I've seen it go wrong. I covered the war in Yugoslavia. I know how economic breakdown can vomit up some very frightening figures like Radovan Karadzic and Slobodan Milosevic. Um, we are not immune from that. We have that capacity. Uh, but I think as all of us who care about a civil society and the restoration of democracy, it's incumbent upon us to uh, recognize that nonviolent acts of civil disobedience are probably the only way we have left of affecting that system. Wendell Berry, a writer I admire very much, 77 years old, uh, occupied the was it, governor's office in Kentucky against mountaintop removal. And he said when he went in, you know, go to jail is more time than I care to donate to the U.S. government. Uh, and yet I think that we have to begin to make those forms of self-sacrifice while there's still time. Uh, if things unravel, if the security and surveillance state, uh, which now has the legal power to essentially shut down and criminalize any dissent, uh, 
uh, doesn't make that peaceful, nonviolent space available anymore, um, then, you know, whatever backlash comes, and it will come, uh, I believe. Um, you know, maybe one that, uh, you know, as we've seen in other countries around the world is quite frightening. Thank you.